Um, Margaret is, is well known to everyone, so I, I think I can be very brief. Uh, she's had a very distinguished career from Canada to Oxford at the moment. She, is, uh, she was warden of St. Anthony's College. She's a fellow of Lady Margaret Hall. Her books, I'm sure, are well known to many of you. Peacekeepers, of course, um, one of my favorites, The Use and Abuse of History, a very germane, of course, given uh, Vladimir Putin's famous 5,000 word essay on whether Ukraine was part of Russia or not, which he wrote during his sequestration in the Kremlin uh, at the height of the COVID crisis. But she is now going to continue uh, discussing war and alliances. And today she will be talking about alliances and the early years of the Second World War. Now, this is a digital event. Uh, and, uh, it's a hybrid event, I should say. So uh, I'm very glad that you've come here in person today. But we also have a lot of people who are online uh, who will be uh, also involved in asking questions. And can I ask those people, as soon as the questions come, to put their questions in the Q&A session? What we'll do after Margaret speaks is open this to you to ask questions, and then we'll go to online Q&A session. So without further ado, Margaret, can I invite you to speak? Thank you very much. Um, rather curious to be at a hybrid event. Um, we're all hybrids, I guess. Um, but it's very pleasant actually to see people. I think this is the first time I've talked to human beings in a real place since COVID began. When I started thinking about this subject, I'm, I'm in the middle of, or near the middle of writing a book on the Grand Alliance in the Second World War. And I was writing about history and I've been reading a lot about what was happening then. I didn't, I think, ever imagine that I'd be thinking so much about alliances today. I think like so many of us we're obsessed with the news that is coming from Ukraine and, and we're looking at the ways in which the different sides are reacting, looking at what support they have, looking at sort of alliances. And so I think the topic of what alliances are is one that has a tremendous resonance today and one that we're going to go on thinking about. There is, as you probably know, debate among those in, in international relations, international history, about how you should define an alliance. And I talked in my earlier lectures about some of the ways in which alliances can be defined. I mean, one rather narrow definition, which is favored by a lot of IR theorists, is an alliance is a coming together of nations to maximize their force for a particular end, either to um, win a war or to avoid defeat. And I would prefer, I think, to take a slightly broader definition, and that is an alliance can often be for other goals than war. Um, we're thinking about alliances in war at the moment, but alliances can be to if you like, build a better world. They can be to encourage economic integration of the world. They can be to deal with climate change. And so an alliance can be, I think, a number of things. It's a coming together of groups, in this case nations, with different interests, but who see a common purpose where they can at least manage those different interests. The greater the threat, of course, the more likely it is that it will produce a strong alliance um, but that people will realize that alone they cannot deal with the threat that they're going to have to deal with it in, in tangent with other people. That doesn't mean the alliances are going to work. Alliances are notoriously difficult, difficult to bring about, difficult to manage, difficult to keep together. Often they fall apart because the partners simply find their interests are diverging too much. Sometimes what you get, and I think we're seeing it now increasingly with China and Russia today, you'll get an alliance, which is not a, truly in a way a, a cooperation. It's more one dominant partner um, telling the less, less powerful partner what to do. And I think I predict, and historians shouldn't predict, but I predict that President Putin will find that his alliance with China becomes very much that sort of alliance, that he has lost ground, partly because of the dismal performance of his troops in Ukraine, and that China will become very much the more powerful partner. And so that Russia in the next years will find itself very much doing what its big alliance partner would want it to do. What also I think we have to remember is that alliances are dynamic, that they change. And they're not just an agreement like a, like a business contract, even though those can change, but they're a relationship. And the relationship will change. It has to be managed, which is where, of course, 
diplomacy comes in. And what I want to talk to about, what I want to talk to you about today is the Grand Alliance, which came into being in the Second World War. The first stage of that Grand Alliance, in the end, the Grand Alliance was between Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union came in last of all. The United States was reluctant initially, understandably given its history and its interests, to form an alliance with Britain. And so this is an alliance which developed over time and it changed as time went by, as the fortunes of war changed, as the economic development of the different countries changed. At the beginning of the alliance, when the British and the Americans began to talk to each other about shared interests in opposing Hitler and, and Mussolini and their allies in Europe, the British were very much the senior partner. They had the bigger armed forces, they had their very large empire, the United States, partly as a result of its own policies in the 1930s was not prepared in any way for a war. And I think there was a very strong sentiment in the United States to try and stay out of the war. But gradually that de developed again as, as the war developed and the United States or significant proportion of public opinion and leadership in the United States became convinced that if they did not form an alliance of some sort with Britain, that Britain would be defeated and the United States would then face a much stronger Germany and, and its partners alone. And so the alliance was one that developed over time. It was not easy to develop it. I mean, I think we have tended to assume that because the United States and Britain have many of the same traditions, have many of the same types of values and institutions, and of course speak the same language, that they were gonna find it quite easy to come to terms. And of course, it wasn't going to be so. To develop a relationship meant that they had to overcome a certain amount of history. Um, some of that history going back to the founding of the United States, which was founded, of course, as an act of rebellion against the British. And this has been, you know, one of the foundational stories in the United States about what makes the United States different. And right from the founding of the United States, I think there was a strong sense, and I think we can see it throughout history and, and see it today, that the United States was not just rebelling against a distant ruler, but it was also rebelling against an old Europe. It was a new world, it was creating a new sort of society, and it was rejecting many of the values that it saw as outdated, old, or improper. But much more recently, in the relationship between the United States and, and, and Britain, there were memories of their previous clashes and their previous collaborations. American memories of the First World War were not completely happy ones. The Americans, many of them came to think they should never have entered the war, in the first place, which they entered in 1917, that they had been somehow inveigled into that war by the British who they regarded as devious and slippery and totally unreliable, but at some point rather persuasive. Um, they wished, I think many Americans, that President Wilson had not gone to Congress and got a declaration of war in 1917. And in the periods between the wars, that feeling I think grew and it was fueled by journalists, fueled by historians, fueled by the popular press, that the United States should never have gone into this war. And various um, culprits were, was, were found apart from President Wilson. Um, there was a very important committee of the Senate set, chaired by Senator Nye in the 1930s, which tried to prove that the manufacturers of weapons had really created the war in order to keep their profits up. Um, the merchants of death, as, as, as the phrase had it. There was also, I think, a strong feeling in the United States that the United States, as it grew in economic power, it was not yet growing as much in military power, but as it grew in economic power, it was becoming more and more threat to Britain and to British interests and, and to the British empire. And that the British would recognize this and do their best to throttle American progress. Um, I've just been reading about American military planning between the wars. And a number of the plans that were made between the two world wars were made assuming that Britain would be the enemy, not Germany, not Italy, um, possibly not even Japan. The military in particular, the army, but the Navy also, I think initially shared in this, saw that Brit the British as pr probably likely to use force to prevent the United States from assuming its proper place in the world as a major economic power. And so for example, in 1930, the American military drew up a war plan in which the, the code name for Britain was Red. And they said, you know, it, is, it has been the habit of Red to use military force to enhance and protect its economic power. And I'll quote from you 
History indicates that red, i.e. Britain, has never hesitated to go to war to maintain its dominance in world trade. And so the American military were actually drawing up plans about how they would fight the British if a war came because of the economic rivalry that the United States was beginning to pose to British interests. The Navy gradually in the course of the 30s, partly out of concern with the rising power of Japan, began to swing away from this position. And you began to get um, top senior naval planners and, and naval commanders arguing that in fact, the main threat to the United States increasingly was Japan and that they would be better off cooperating with Britain, which had extensive interests in Asia. But that lingered, that suspicion of the British, that suspicion of British motives was going to be something that did not just affect the military. Um, it affected people in positions of power in Washington. It affected those who were making decisions and it affected the British public. And I'd, I'd like, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But what I'd like to do today is talk, just so I, you know that I'm not gonna just talk about the hatred between the United States and, and Britain. What I want to do is talk about the emergence of the first stage of the Grand Alliance, and that was the Anglo-American Alliance in the Second World War until they became full allies at the end of 1941. And so it's those first years of the Second World War where the groundwork was laid and the structures and, and, and procedures and personal understandings were set up that made it possible for the British and the Americans to, to work with each other in spite of their natural antipathy in many ways to each other. Now on that alliances, and I, I, I put the map up so you can see what Europe was like at the beginning of the Second World War, British, the French, the Poles formed what looked like apparently a formidable force. Britain and France after the Czech crisis of the beginning of, of March 1939 had guaranteed Poland and it was assumed, I think, by many across the Atlantic, but also in Britain and France, that those three countries would pose a formidable force to Germany if it chose to try and attack Poland or if it chose to attack into France. And in the United States, the assumption was made that in fact, the British, the French, with the aid of the Poles could easily deal with Germany. What the Americans seem to have assumed, and this was going to persist in fact, until the fall of, well, very close to the fall of France in the summer of 1940, was that a second world war in Europe would be like the first world war. That the allies would find themselves in a stalemate on the Western front, and possibly on the Eastern Front, but certainly on the Western Front with the Germans. The French had spent a great deal of time and, and poured resources into building the Maginot Line, this heavily fortified line, which ran along much of the French border up to the Belgian border, which was one of the great defensive works of the 20th century. And it was assumed that the German troops would blunt their attacks on that line and that the war would settle into a stalemate as it had done in the First World War. What the Americans also assumed was that the Atlantic would be patrolled by the British Navy and that therefore shipping, including American shipping, would be able to go back and forth. That they would, be, they would, in other words, the United States and the Americas would be protected by French troops on the ground with the support of British and Polish troops and by the British Navy at sea. And so the Americans were concerned, obviously, about what was happening in Europe and American public opinion was beginning to shift away from indifference to, to concern about what was happening in Europe, but they didn't think they were going to have to do anything very soon. The alliance really was going to develop as the war progressed. Now, there are three different theories about what sort of, or three different descriptions of, of what that alliance is like. Alex Danchev, who was a very fine historian um, of war and, and among many other things, said there are really three essential ways of looking at the Grand Alliance, um, particularly, I think, the alliance between the United States and Britain, because the Soviet Union was a very different type of society and a very different type of regime, and its relationship with both the United States and, and Britain was going to be uh, much more complicated. Danchev said the alliance, certainly between Britain and the United States, is described in three different ways. One school of thought is the evangelists, who think it's the most wonderful thing. It's the same sort of people who still talk about the special relationship between the United States and Britain. The second was the functionalists who said the Alliance was just about protecting their interests. It had no sentiment in it. There was no emotion in it. Um, there was no shared past in it. It was simply a functional Alliance. And the third said to Alex Danchev for the terminalists 
who said, well, if there was any special relationship, it was over by 1943 when the Soviet Union and the United States began to deal more with each other and, and, and Britain became very much the junior partner. I think myself taking, of course, a middle road as, as, as historians often do, is probably a combination of all, all, all of those, that the evangelists were right, that there was something that in, 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 imbued the relationship. Um, sentiment is not everything, emotion is not everything, but I do think there was a very real feeling that they, in some ways, were representing the same sort of values, not always. Britain was a great imperialist nation and the United States has always been very anti-imperialist, but there was a community of interest and a feeling, certainly on the part of Americans, that they wanted to preserve not just their position in Europe, they wanted to preserve British society, they wanted to preserve a people they felt were worth preserving. I think it was also functional, and I think you see this very much in the relationship between President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and they made a great deal of their friendship. They had an intensive correspondence. If you, if you look at their three volumes of letters, which you can look at between Churchill and Roosevelt, and Churchill certainly made a great deal of their close friendship. He sent birthday cards to Roosevelt. They, they spent a lot of time in each other's company, but in the end, they were the heads of their countries and what they were thinking of was the needs of their countries. And so it was a functional relationship. Um, whatever the professions of friendship, I think really at its core, it was that Roosevelt felt that it was important for the United States to get on with Britain and Britain felt not just important, but from the British point of view, it was essential that it get on with the United States. And Churchill made this clear very, very early on when he said to the foreign office and said to the treasury who were objecting to giving too much to the Americans, spending too much money in the United States, um, giving way to the Americans on things, Churchill said, we have to, it is essential for our survival. We have to keep on good terms with the United States. We cannot, Offend, offend them. You know, even when it came down to quite often seemingly trivial things, um, Britain bought various things in the United States before the first Second World War started. One of the things it bought was tobacco from Southern uh, American tobacco growers in the Southern states. And the treasury to save money once the war started said, you know, we really shouldn't be buying this expensive tobacco from the United States. People can do without it. We can buy uh, more tobacco more cheaply, perhaps from, from our Asian possessions. And Churchill said, it is important that American opinion be kept happy. And I want the tobacco purchases to go on. You know, it, it may be expensive, but it keeps American opinion on side. And I think that's a very nice indicator of just how important it was for Churchill that Britain got on with the United States because he recognized, I think before many others did, just how long this struggle was going to be and how difficult it was going to be and how crucial for Britain and of course Churchill hoped also for the British Empire, it was going to be to keep the Americans on side. Now, what they had to do was establish a personal relationship. And I think too often we focus just on that, the relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt, which has been much written about and, and is of course interesting. But what I think we need to recognize in this alliance is it was like a very, very complicated mechanism which built up over time um, that there were really, in the end, thousands of people involved in making it work. And this was beginning to happen even before the war started, when American military began to hold planning sessions, discussion sessions with the British military, that in the end, those who made the relationship work were the military, the ones stationed in the military missions in London, the American military mission in London, the British military mission in, in Washington, the special envoys who often great personal risk flew back and forth or traveled back and forth to the Atlantic during the war, which was dangerous and a number of them were going to die. The relationship also depended on the procurement officials, the people who placed the orders in factories, the people who shared information, the people who shared research. And this was a very complicated relationship at, at many levels without which it couldn't have worked. And so it was not just the big figures at their summits. It was all the people who were constantly working with each other, dealing with each other, often away from home for a very long time. And as I say, often in very dangerous circumstances. Now, what the Americans and British began to have to do as they began to contemplate the challenges facing them, and this was to be, of course, the core of the alliance, was they began to have to work out, and this was difficult, and I'll say more about it in a moment, what was their grand strategy? What was their goal going to be? How were they going to defeat their enemies? And who were their enemies? Because this was not something that was immediately clear from the start. Clearly, Hitler's Germany 
possibly Italy, although it wasn't clear until France fell or close to the fall of France that the Italians were actually going to come into the war. And the big question mark, of course, was Japan. It wasn't at all clear that there was going to be a war with Japan. There was fear that, the, that it would be, but it wasn't clear that there was going to be a war. So what they had to do is try and work out who their enemies were, how they were going to defeat them. And of course, they had to work out who they would defeat first. And this was going to lead to, as we'll see, considerable debate, um, both within the British and, French, uh, British and American ranks, but also between the British and the Americans. Do we concentrate on the European theater, this theater, or do we concentrate on, on the Pacific and Asia? And it, this was not easy to settle. What they did know very early on was that they couldn't do both. Once they had decided on their grand strategy, and it was always under revision, there were always debates about it, people who had lost the argument would often come back and say, I think we need to revisit this as, as, as people do in relationships. They then had to decide on what was their military strategy. If we are going to fight in Europe, first of all, what do we need? Do we need, from the point of view of the Americans, do we need to take a big army to Europe again? Do we want to do that? Do we need to try and invade Europe at all? The British were very reluctant given their losses in the First World War, to see those sorts of losses again, and very, very apprehensive of what a seaborne landing would mean in Europe. I think with reason. I mean, we think how difficult D-Day was in Normandy, and that was after great preparation. You can understand why the British were reluctant to do it. Is it possible, as the British and a number of Americans, particularly those in the American Air Force, felt, is it possible to defeat our enemies by simply bombing them into submission should we concentrate on the air war and so once they had tried to develop a grand strategy what they then had to do was try and work out what was the appropriate military strategy and also what theaters would they concentrate on should they concentrate on the north of europe there were arguments for that or should they once germany and its allies dominated europe should they try and concentrate on the mediterranean should they be concerned about what's happening in the Mediterranean because so many of British communications and ships went through there and through Suez. Should they be concerned about what was happening in the Balkans? Should they be concerned about what was happening in the Middle East? And so just choosing where to fight and how to fight took a huge amount of discussion. And then they had to decide how they would fight together because what you get is two different militaries coming out of different traditions, out of countries which haven't always been friendly. How do they work together? And so a great deal of the discussion that took place um, at the summit meetings with the big leaders, but also at these other meetings and these other missions and these other discussions and these other committees was how to create an effective command structure and how to have proper liaison organizations so that each side knew what the other was doing so that they could actually communicate. So they didn't do things like um, not supporting each other if there was an attack, or they didn't do things like um, Taking, a, taking equipment that the other might need for a particular thing. In the First World War, it had taken the British and the French really over three years to try and get that sort of cooperation and coordination. And it was only in the last year of the war that the British and the French finally came together and got a single commander. And this was something that in the Second World War we see happening an awful lot, um, an awful lot quicker, at least between Britain and the United States. And the Soviet Union, which I'll be talking about more in my last lecture, never really cooperated on that level to that extent with the Americans and the British. The British and the Americans fought together in North Africa, they fought together in Italy, they fought together in the West of Europe. The Soviet war was really a separate war. And the Soviets, given their habits of secrecy and suspicion of outsiders, even those who are their allies, were not prepared to work in any sustained way and reveal anything particularly valuable um, to those who, who were technically their allies. And then finally, of course, there was the less glamorous part of war, which is absolutely the crucial part of war, and those are the logistics. You cannot fight a war, as the Russians are discovering in Ukraine today, if you don't have the gas to make your equipment run. You can't fight a war if you don't have food for your soldiers. You can't fight a war if supplies don't keep on coming. And so the logistical effort was absolutely enormous. Um, it involved factories, farm producers, mines from around the world, fueling the war effort, um, particularly far flung, fueling it once the Japanese came into the war everywhere from Asia, through the Burma Road, for example, and through shipping into India and in Europe. And it meant, of course, keeping the oceans open. And that was one of the uh, crucial parts of the war. 
Well, it, as I say, wasn't easy to develop this relationship and there were to be many sort of fits and starts. I just want to remind us all of what the attitudes were like in both Britain and the United States before the war started, because attitudes I think do matter. And you get particular types of attitudes in, in, in government institutions. Zara Steiner has talked very well about the official mind, about how you'll get people in say the foreign office who develop a collective outlook um, about those they're dealing with. And I think it's very important sometimes that the, the, these official minds be challenged because they become almost self-fulfilling. If you're the British Foreign Office, you attract certainly in the 1920s and 1930s, a certain type of person, a man from a certain type of social class who will be acculturated, unless they're very strong and, and independent minded, will be acculturated into the culture of that foreign office. And the foreign office, and it was, I think, typical of many British elites, had a view of the Americans as crude, over-emotional, uneducated. They had contempt for American democracy. They thought American democracy was corrupt and irrational. And you see this in the private correspondence, but even in some of the official memos that are sent back and forth for internal use only. You, know, you can't expect anything from Congress. They're, they're a bunch of savages. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, it's hopeless. We can't deal with these people. A saying that a lot of British like to repeat to each other was, which was variously attributed to Oscar Wilde and, and various other people, was that the United States is the only country in the history of the world which has gone from barbarism to decadence without an intervening period of civilization in between. You know, these you know, jokes often, I think, reveal how people are thinking of each other. And I think this was a way in which the British tended to think of the Americans. Of course, they didn't know much about them directly. I mean, except for a few people who could afford to do it, most people didn't travel that much or travel as much as today. And, and a lot of them, a British wouldn't go to the United States by choice. They'd prefer to go to the continent or they might go to somewhere like Africa. It's true that British people left Britain and went to live in the United States, but in many cases they were going because they didn't like Britain. Um, a lot of Irish went to the United States. And as you can imagine, the Irish did not have a particularly favorable view of the British upper classes and the British government. Um, senator Joseph, oh, sorry, not Senator, his son became a Senator. Um, Joe Kennedy, who was the British, the American ambassador in London, had a, a real distaste for the British. Um, he felt, and he, Irish background, Boston Irish, you, you can understand um, where, he, where he gets it from. Um, on the other side, the Americans had their view of the British. They saw the British, particularly those in positions of, of power and authority, as decadent aristocrats. They thought they were devious and untrustworthy. They disapproved strongly of, of, of British imperialism. And the Americans have always had a blind spot, I think, about imperialism. They don't recognize that they have too been an imperial power and they're very quick to condemn others for having colonies. Um, there's a wonderful saying, I can't, or a scrap from a letter I came across today, um, Air Commodore Slesser, who was, was a key figure in the military planning in the Second World War, was at a very long negotiation in, in Washington at which the Americans at one point lost their temper because they felt the British were going behind their backs and trying to call in Churchill to deal with, just deal with, with Roosevelt. And Slesser said, actually, you know, we, we didn't do anything wrong this time, but he said, well, he said we were stupid. And he said, the, the Americans think we are so devious that even when we do something stupid, they think we've really got some very dark motives behind it and we're doing something very tricky. Um, and I think it does, you know, these, these things are not easy to deal with. And it was, there was to be a painful learning experience. And it didn't help that a lot of the British who were dealing with American officers, for example, or dealing with American diplomats took a rather grand attitude and kept telling them what to do and kept telling them that we, the British, actually have had a great deal of experience in this. And Harold Macmillan, later, of course, Prime Minister, who was the chief British representative in the, in the Mediterranean, said to Richard Crossman, then a young officer, later on a, a well-known politician, he said, you know, he said, the Americans are powerful and they're getting more powerful, but we shall be with them. And he was going to repeat this much later on, but he said it during the war, he said, we will be to the Americans as the Greeks were to the Romans. We are the civilized ones. We will show them how to deal with the world. And the Americans are the barbarians who will take our advice if we're, if we're clever about it. And, and that took, I think, quite a while to overcome. And I'm not sure it ever was entirely overcome. Well, one of the questions which became, of course, more and more pressing 
1939 came around was would there be a war? And it became, I think, pretty clear by August 1939 that there would be. And the final indication of that, if anyone needed it, was the Nazi Soviet Pact, otherwise known as the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, where the Soviet Union, which both the United States and the British regarded with deep suspicion and had not really done much to try and talk to, the Soviet Union signed a, a non aggression pact with Germany. And what that meant essentially was that Poland was doomed, the center of Europe was doomed. Although they denied it, there was a secret protocol to the non-aggression pact that essentially divided up the middle of Europe between them. And Germany moved very quickly after that pact was signed at the beginning of September, moved into Poland. Interestingly enough, just for, for those of us who've been looking at what's happening today, creating an incident in which it claimed that German troops had been attacked by Polish troops and Germany was simply defending itself. Um, it's, it's an old and, and as we see still popular tactic. The United States now faced a dilemma. I think opinion was beginning to shift, but it was still not pro-Britain. It was certainly Americans did not want to get involved in the war. But the question now, both for the British and the Americans was would the Americans eventually come in as a belligerent? As far as Americans were concerned, this was not something they wanted. And interestingly enough, it was not necessarily something the British wanted either. Um, the British felt, at least until the summer of 1940, that they and their French allies could deal with Nazi Germany. They could cope with it. They didn't want the Americans intervening because they felt the Americans would try and run things. And this had occurred at the end of the First World War as well, when the British and French had become concerned at the growing power of the US. They wanted the war to end quickly by 1918 because they didn't want the United States to dictate the peace settlements. And that was also a fear in 1939. They were not to know how quickly France would be defeated. But the feeling certainly in, on both sides of the Atlantic in 1939 was that the United States probably wouldn't have to come in. Having said that, there was enough concern in the United States to start a series of conversations with the British and enough, I think, concern on the British side to think that this actually might be a good thing. American opinion, was beginning to become at least unsympathetic to Germany, which meant that it was likely to become more sympathetic to Britain. Um, Kristallnacht in 1938, when Jewish businesses were ransacked, um, Jews were publicly humiliated and beaten on the streets of Germany, helped, I think, to swing American opinion against Germany, to see Nazi Germany as, as a very dangerous power. President Roosevelt, who is extremely difficult to understand, who, who very rarely revealed what he was thinking, did, however, seem to be steering American opinion by the late 1930s, certainly in 38 and 39, towards apprehension of the growing power of Nazi Germany and its allies. He was a master at communication, even though sometimes it was very difficult to know what it was he was communicating. But what he could do is communicate an attitude and communicate apprehension. And what he began to say to the Americans, he, he did this in press conferences where he was very skillful, but also in fireside chats. And what he began to do is say, you know, we've always been safe because we have two big oceans. We're protected by our geography. We haven't had any menace from enemies. You know, we have Canada to the north, and what are Canadians going to do to us? Well, little did they know, I speak as a Canadian, we had a very good plan um, that if we'd gone to war with them, we would have shot down the Mississippi Valley and they would have sued for peace immediately. Um, this, anyway, this is one of our plans in 1928. Uh, luckily, we didn't have to put it into things. But, you know, the United States has been protected by its geography. It doesn't have enemies on its borders. It has this huge expanse of ocean on either side. And what Roosevelt very cleverly began to do was to say, you know, we've always had this, but look at technology. There are now faster boats. There are submarines that can now reach our shores from Europe and the airplane. The airplane is developing very, very fast. We're no longer as safe as we thought. And so he begins in his own rather complicated and, and not very clear way to move the American public opinion, not towards necessarily um, wanting to go to war. Certainly he's not prepared to do this. And, and he seems himself to have had a deep aversion to war. What he is doing, however, is preparing Americans for the prospect they may no, no longer be safe and that they may have to think of ways to deal with it. And so American opinion begins to shift. And when the war breaks out, there's a very interesting poll shortly after the war started. 
Uh, there's a Dr. Gallup has just started doing sampling and doing public opinion polls. It's a new thing and people are quite intrigued by it. And he seems to be right. He seems to have a good sense of, of what public opinion is. And Dr. Gallup does a poll shortly after the war starts. 95% of those who were questioned were in favor of staying out of the war, but 83% wanted Britain and France to win. And so it was an interesting poll, which I think looking back in retrospect may indicate the beginnings of a shift in American public opinion. Roosevelt was officially head of a country that was neutral, but he began again in his own way to use the powers of his office and began to try and pressure Congress to shift the American position slightly. And so one thing that he did, for example, in September 1939 is he repealed that there'd been a series of neutrality acts passed in Congress but sorry, I thought I'd done something wrong. I thought, I thought I'd probably done something to the, um, a series of neutrality acts passed in the 1930s, which made it very difficult for a president to favor one side or another in a war, um, that America was to be absolutely neutral between belligerents, not selling them war equipment, uh, not favoring one over the other, not lending them money. And what Roosevelt managed to do was get the repeal of a key provision in the 1938 neutrality act. The provision said, that once a war starts, the president has to declare both sides belligerent and the United States can't sell anything to them. And Roosevelt argued effectively, I think, that by not selling equipment to Britain and France, which depended on orders from the new world far more than Germany did, in fact, the United States was favoring Germany. And so he got the embargo provisions lifted and the British and the French began to place orders for military equipment and the other sorts of things they needed on a cash and carry basis. They had to pay cash and they had to take whatever they bought away in their own ships. The United States was not gonna get involved in anything more than that. It was, not, it was not going to use its own ships. They also encouraged, and the British and French did this, to place orders for the future. And so in March, 1940, the British placed a major aircraft order from, to, with, with the United States, which clearly was not going to be fulfilled and probably for another year or so. Well, the war in this first phase was, as, as people often said, once Poland was, was destroyed, was a phony war, not much happened, but there was intense diplomatic and, and other activity behind the scenes. The Chamberlain government remained in office in Britain. And this I think made relations with the United States complicated because Chamberlain himself was not very keen on the Americans, was not particularly um, eager to, to involve them in, in any sort of planning, had the attitude which so much of the Foreign Office had that in fact they could manage on their own and they didn't really want the United States getting involved that much. But Winston Churchill, who was going to be a key figure in the summer of 1941, 1940, sorry, Winston Churchill comes back to the Admiralty as First Lord of the Admiralty and begins a correspondence with Roosevelt. Now Roosevelt actually initiates it. Um, he writes at the same time to Chamberlain, but the letter to Churchill, I think, is the more important one because he's asking for information and he's talking about naval issues. And, and Roosevelt was passionately interested in naval matters. He'd been an assistant secretary of the Navy in the First World War. And Roosevelt writes to Churchill saying, look, we're sympathetic. Um, please keep me informed. Um, and Churchill does. And so the correspondence starts and you can see even in those early days, Churchill is trying to influence Roosevelt, trying to appeal to him trying to make a friend of him. Um, Churchill writes far more letters, probably seven times as many letters to Roosevelt as Roosevelt ever writes to him, but it's going to be a very, very important correspondence. And it helps to change American opinion about Churchill. Um, the prevailing view, if, if there was a view in Washington of Churchill was that he was a has-been, he was an old, he was 69 when, when the war started. Joe Kennedy, the American ambassador in, in London who, had been all for Chamberlain and appeasement, um, thought very badly of Churchill and sent reports back to Washington that he was drunk the whole time, he was incoherent, he couldn't do anything. Um, so the view in Washington was not favorable, but I think the correspondence actually began to help and began to, as what was happening in Europe, began to shift American opinion, often imperceptibly, but this was to be crucial in what happened later on. Roosevelt also began to take steps to try and guarantee the safety of the Americas. In October, 1939, he persuaded the American republics of South America and, and Central America to declare a 300 mile wide zone around the waters offshore of the Americas, 
where belligerent ships could not come. The only place that ships from the belligerent countries could come was to Canada, because Canada was a belligerent itself, and to some of the islands in the Caribbean, which were owned by, still owned by European powers. But for the rest, this very large body of water was to be patrolled by the US Navy. And the US Navy was going to do its best to ensure that belligerents, including the Britain, British, but also, of course, the, the Germans, would not be able to come there. Um, in fact, it, it favored the Allies uh, because the Allies were still able to use the waters around Canada and still able to use their shipping um, to come and take goods away. Well, the spring of 1940 suddenly sped everything up. Um, the expectations that this was going to be a war like the First World War were suddenly, suddenly shattered. Now I'm sorry, I just got to find my clicker here. Oops. Ah, there we are. Thank you. Um, this is, I think you've probably seen a famous photograph, Hitler's only visit to Paris. He came for a day to um, witness his triumph. The French had just signed an armistice. Um, French armies had collapsed much more quickly than anyone thought um, they'd assumed. And, and it was true over in Moscow as well. Stalin had assumed that the French would hold out um, for two or three years as they had done before. And instead, France collapsed very quickly. The British were left, British expeditionary force was left in, in uh, France in a very dangerous position. In the end, the British managed to evacuate a lot of them through Dunkirk, but this was not at all clear when this triumphal march was done. The shock in the United States was great. The Americans suddenly faced the prospect that this barrier between them and Nazi Germany, which they had assumed would last for some time while they gradually built up their war economy and rearmed, had, had suddenly gone. And increasingly, opinion in the United States, and again, Roosevelt played a part in this, opinion in the United States came to be seen, focused on Germany as a menace to democracy, as a menace to the United States. And in fact, people began to go through some of Hitler's writings, including in Mein Kampf, where he does talk about the menace of the United States and how eventually um, Germany will seek to dominate it as well. And so a very, very unfavorable position, um, image of the United States is being developed. But isolationism was still a force. This is a rally with the great aviator Charles Lindbergh, who was a genuine American hero, and who was one of the leading isolationists, extremely effective as a speaker. And you can see with the picture of George Washington, they're playing on that American exceptionalism, that sense that we are a nation apart from other nations, that we don't need to entangle ourselves in entangling alliances with the rest of the world. And they were strong in public opinion, and they were still strong in parts of the country, in the Midwest often, and also still strong in Congress. And so it was to be a complicated process, and, and people often criticize Roosevelt for not confronting it directly, but I think he was actually wise that if he moved out too far ahead of American opinion, um, the isolationists would grow in support. Gradually, as I say, he began to shift very cleverly Roosevelt appointed as his secretary of the Navy, a Republican from Chicago. Um, Chicago was one of the centers of American isolationism and Frank Knox had been, I think, sympathetic to it. But he said after the fall of France and he was to become a very effective secretary of the Navy, he said they, meaning his fellow countrymen, are beginning to see that if Germany can beat all of Western Europe to its knees in record time, we're not any too safe over here. And so, the events of the war begin to focus American attention in a way that hadn't been possible before. And Churchill began to be seen increasingly not as someone who was a has-been who drank too much, but as someone who was extremely brave, who was capable of leading Britain. And Americans began, and they would listen to them throughout the war, to listen to Churchill's broadcasts. And he became extremely popular in the United States. Um, and he was, you've probably heard some of his broadcasts, he was a great orator. Churchill played a very important role both in rally rallying British opinion, uh, determination to fight on with the famous speeches about how we will never give up. And that also played well in the United States. The Americans were impressed. They weren't sure that he'd be able to hang on. They were worried about what would happen if Britain fell. One of the things that the American government increasingly began to ask anxiously about was what will happen to the British fleet. Will you sail it to safety in Canada? Because from the American point of view, if the Germans got hold of the British fleet, this would be um, very, very serious indeed. The American fleet simply at that stage, which was stretched between the Pacific and the Atlantic, was not 
uh, capable of patrolling and defending the whole of the Atlantic. And so there was a very anxious time where the British didn't want to commit themselves to sending their fleet away because they felt it would be bad for British morale. And the Americans are trying to press them to make a firm, a firm commitment. But the British did, as we know, hang on. The Battle of Britain in August 1940, the Germans tried and came close to succeeding in destroying British air defenses, but they didn't. And then the Germans switched. Um, Goebbels, uh, sorry, Goering assured Hitler that instead of having a, an expensive seaboard invasion of Britain, that he, Goering, and his Luftwaffe could destroy British morale by bombing the cities. And so the Battle of Britain was succeeded by the Blitz. And again, the British hung on. Churchill, who was always in his own way, both a realist and, a, and an optimist, said at that point, General, so General Charles de Gaulle, um, the leader of the Free French mentions in his memoirs, he said he went to see Churchill um, as the Blitz was going on. And Churchill said, you know, let them come. The more the better. And, and de Gaulle said, what are you talking about? And Churchill said, you see, he said, the bombing of Oxford, Coventry, Canterbury will cause such a wave of indignation in the United States if they'll come into the war. Um, you know, Churchill was prepared, I think, to look in this way, it sounds terribly cold hearted, but you can understand what he's seeing. He is, I think, extremely conscious of the importance of American opinion. And so as the British hang on, the Americans begin again, or begin or increase it, increasingly show that as much as possible, they are sliding towards support for Britain. But Roosevelt is absolutely determined that he will not declare war. Um, he's prepared to support Britain, but he doesn't want American troops fighting abroad. But what he does do, for example, in August 1940, he signs an agreement with the Canadian Prime Minister, Canada, of course, still part of the British Empire in that point, signs an agreement with the Canadian Prime Minister for a permanent joint board of defense, which actually still exists today. And this was to integrate the defense of Canada and the United States. What he also does is sign an agreement in September 1940 with the British swapping destroyers um, often obsolete American destroyers, but still nevertheless, um, probably important to the British, start swapping those for bases. And the British provided bases on a number of their islands, including Newfoundland and some of the Caribbean islands like St. Lucia for American shipping. And so it was a swap, but it was again an indication of the ways in which American opinion was beginning to change. Interestingly enough, that destroys of the bases deal also had an important impact on the Germans, the Japanese, and the Italians, who thought that this indicated the United States was about to come into the war. And so they signed the Tripartite Pact, which again affected American public opinion. The Americans now becoming even more concerned about this front that seems to be developing against them. Churchill continues to insist that whatever happens, the Americans must be kept on side. But there is a very, very difficult period where the United States goes very quiet. Um, between about September and November 1940, because there was a presidential election. And Roosevelt doesn't, he, he, he decides to run for a third term, which breaks an unspoken rule, which is controversial in itself that you don't run for a third term. There's now a prohibition against it in the constitution and an amendment, but in those days it was just an unspoken convention. And he doesn't want to do anything that will whip up isolationist opinion. He doesn't want, to do anything that will concern Americans. And he gives what it turns out to be, I think, a rather um, fateful pledge in a press conference when he's pushed to ask, will Americans go abroad in the case of a war? And he says, I promise American mothers, their sons will not fight abroad. Um, and so he is, I think, bending to isolationist opinion, but he's reelected with a landslide. And so he now has a much freer hand and the correspondence with Churchill begins to pick up, the support for Britain begins to pick up. Roosevelt goes off to recover from the exhaustion of the election on a cruise. He, he, he loved going on cruises. He goes off to a cruise in the Caribbean and he's talking to one of his advisors, Harry Hopkins, about a letter. This is December, 1940, that he's just received from Churchill. And Churchill wrote one of his most eloquent and heartfelt letters. Um, he said later, one of the most difficult letters I ever wrote in which he said to Roosevelt, he said, you know, thank you for all the support you've given us, so on, and I hope you're well and all this. We cannot go on much longer. We cannot keep fighting. Our shipping losses are so great. We cannot replace the ships that are being lost. We cannot patrol the Atlantic and we're not getting 
the equipment we need and we're not getting the supplies we needed, we are sort of on the edge of not being able to carry on. It was a really heartfelt letter and Roosevelt took it with him on the cruise. He thought about it. He had one of his closest advisors, a man called Harry Hopkins with him. And he sat and chatted to Hopkins. He said, you know, how do we help the British without enraging American opinion? One of the things that the Americans had never really got over was that the British had borrowed money from the United States in the First World War and had defaulted on their payments in 1934 at the height of the depression. And a lot of Americans saw this as signs of untrustworthiness, deviousness, you shouldn't lend the British any money, they, they'll never pay it back. And so Roosevelt said to Hopkins, how do I get around that? How do I make available to the British what it is they need? And according to Hopkins, whose memoirs are always lively but not necessarily reliable, Roosevelt said, I know how I'll do it. I'll lease it to them, I'll lend it to them, then they can pay me later. And this is the origin of Lend-Lease, which was to be extremely important in supporting first the British war effort and then the Russian, the, or the Soviet war effort. What Lend-Lease was, was a way of allowing the British to place orders in the United States for what they needed, allowing them to get the equipment needed on the understanding they would either replace it or pay back what they had bought later. And in fact, the British did eventually pay it back. And Roosevelt made one of his classic fireside speeches in which he talked to the American people. And he said, look, he said, when your neighbor's house is on fire and he comes to you and says, can I borrow a hose? Do you say, no, you better pay for it now than let your house burn down? No, you say, take the hose. If you, you know, break it, if, it, if it's damaged in any way, or if you, you know, you can't give me the hose back, pay me later. I don't want your house to burn down. You know, he, what, where Roosevelt's genius was, I think, was in these images. Everyone who listened to it could understand it. And so Lend-Lease went through Congress. It was finalized in, in March, 1941. And supplies began. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention this. I'm so sorry. Um, this, this was earlier on when the, when the British were um, at, you know, fighting for their lives and the Americans weren't sure they'd survive. And one of the things, a very difficult thing, sorry to digress slightly, but it is important. One of the very difficult things the British did was shell the French Navy. Um, a large part of the French Navy had surrendered, was in port in Algeria. And the British were extremely concerned as were the Americans that it would be used against British and American shipping. And the British asked the French to surrender it to them, the Vichy government, which succeeded the French government, which made the deal with, with, with the Germans, refused to do so. And so the British, after warnings, which unfortunately didn't get through, sank a lot of the French ships at Oran. Um, it was something which a lot of the French have never forgiven the British for, but what it did do was persuade a lot of Americans that the British would do anything to survive. Sorry, I, sh I should have mentioned this, this earlier. Um, at any rate, Lend-Lease, uh, where are we? Um, Lend-Lease begins and huge amounts of equipment, and this is just gunpowder, but ships, machine tools, anything that you need for making war began to flow across the Atlantic. And it was really, I think, going to enable, as, as Churchill had hoped, the British to stay in the war. Harry Hopkins, the man who Roosevelt had been talking with in this cruise, who became one of the early administrators of Lend-Lease, who was very close to Roosevelt, Hopkins paid a visit to London, the first visit he'd ever he'd paid there when Churchill was prime minister in January 1941, and Churchill gave him a very warm welcome, had him to stay, and the two men hit it off very well. And when Hopkins went back to the United States, he did what I think Churchill would have hoped he would do. He said to Roosevelt, Churchill is key, Churchill is the government, Churchill, everything depends on Churchill. He's reinvigorated the British war effort. He will keep them in the war. And by the way, he's not a drunk, um, which we can, we can debate. Um, at any rate, it was a, it, it, there were now very, very important um, changes being made. What also happened between January and March, 1941 was that a top level British delegation of military people came to Washington and had effectively two or three months conversations with their American counterparts in which they worked out a common strategy. And so you can see the relationship deepening. They still are not at war, but the relationship now is much, much closer. The Americans are clearly moving on to the, the, the British side. The British are getting assistance from the United States, which is making it possible for them to stay in the, in the war. And they're now beginning to talk about how, if they fight together, they would fight. Um, these conversations between the military are not easy. 
partly because they don't trust each other. Um, again, the British and, and the Americans looking at each other with suspicion, but partly also because there are differences among the military on each side themselves. And the American Navy thinks the Pacific is more important. The American army doesn't want to send troops to Europe. The British Navy wants to um, do the war in certain ways. The British army has other ideas. And so they're rather complicated discussions, both among the different delegations, but, but with each other. And of course, what they have to discuss is, is who is their prime enemy? And they eventually come to the decision, and this is approved by their superiors, by, by, by Roosevelt and by Churchill, that Germany must be defeated first before Japan. It's not clear that Japan's going to come into the war. It's assumed it probably will, but nevertheless, it is assumed that Germany must be defeated first. And that is partly because the menace from Germany and German U-boats is, is much more immediate to the United States in the Atlantic, but also because it's assumed wrongly by the British and, and the Americans that Germany is the dominant partner and tells Japan what to do. Um, this wasn't true at all. The Japanese did what they wanted, but nevertheless, that was the assumption. So the assumption was if you want to defeat the Axis powers, as they were increasingly called, you defeat Germany first and Japan will probably, will probably fold. There were arguments, and these were not easy, and sometimes they got very angry with each other. There were arguments with what theaters, where do they, where do they concentrate? Do they concentrate in the Mediterranean? If they try and deal with the Japanese threat in the Pacific, which bit of the Pacific? Um, the Americans were in the Philippines. The British, of course, had the, the jewel of the crown of the British Empire in, in India. What's the most important part of the Pacific? And what about China? How much do we support China, which has been defeated, been fighting uh, Japan since 1936? So a lot of complicated issues, which were going to remain. I mean, these were never going to be settled easily. The important thing, I think, is they're talking to each other and they're talking about ways in which they can cooperate with each other. The fear that the British have, of course, is that if Japan comes into the war, it might just attack British possessions, which won't bring the United States in, that they might have to fight a two-front war, which they simply don't have the resources to do. Um, the American fear, of course, is that the Japanese might attack them and they won't have support from the British. And so much is up in the air. They can't make, they, they're making plans, but they can't make firm decisions about strategy um, until things begin to shift. Well, what begins to shift is that Germany attacks Russia in Operation Barbarossa in June, 1941. Stalin seems to have been completely taken by surprise by this. He had been faithfully fulfilling the terms of his understandings and various economic deals with Germany, right up to the last moment, delivering to Germany material that Germany could use for war. When Churchill tried to get warning to him that British intelligence had picked up reports that Germany was planning an attack on, on the Soviet Union, Stalin wrote it off as typical capitalist mischief making that he was trying to disrupt the friendship between the Soviet Union and Germany. And Soviet troops were kept right at the border. They were told when the first German waves of, of invaders came in not to fire back because it might annoy the Germans. Um, Stalin continued to think this was, this was a mistake. It wasn't. And initially, Operation Barbarossa seemed to be a terrific success for the Germans. German, oh, sorry, German forces swept into Russia and by the autumn were on the outskirts of Moscow and getting close to, to Leningrad. So that it was um, a very, very sudden shift in the war. And again, as with Britain, there was concern both in Britain and the United States about whether Russia would be able to hang on. Churchill, who had made a career as a young politician, as someone who was anti-communist, anti the Bolsheviks when they seized power in Russia in 1917, made another of his speeches in which he said, I have always opposed communism. I disagreed with it, but we are in a different situation now. And he said, the time has come to defeat Hitler and Nazism. And among other things, he said, any man or any state who fights against Nazism will have our aid. And so the British immediately sent um, delegation off to Moscow, offering, off, offering the, the, the Soviets a full, a, full, um, a full treaty. Harry Hopkins went off at Roosevelt's wish to Moscow and had a long meeting with Stalin, who up to this point had been very reluctant to meet the American ambassador or the British ambassador, suddenly um, was in a rather different um, state of mind about this. And Hopkins basically said to Stalin, tell us what you need. Just give us lists and we'll do our best to provide it. And Soviet Union eventually was going to be within the next few months included in Lend-Lease. And so the nature of the war shifts in an extraordinary way in the summer of 1941, 
And suddenly there is this new ally, the Soviet Union. Well, if the United States and Britain have had um, a difficult relationship with each other and mutual suspicions, you can only guess at what the difficult relationship and mutual suspicions are between Britain and the United States. I mean, there, there is not a happy history between those countries, but I think what is important is, is the war is now beginning to change. It's going to be, as Churchill later says in his memoirs, a very long slog, but the relationship is not only going to change with the advent of the Soviet Union, the relationship between the United States and Britain is going to deepen. In August, 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill meet for the first time um, probably not the first time, actually. Um, Churchill said we'd never met before, and Roosevelt remembered meeting Churchill in London in 1918 and thinking he was an absolute creep. Um, to think finding him very unpleasant indeed, but Churchill seems not to have remembered this. Um, and in the Churchill memoirs, you get this, how wonderful it was to meet President Roosevelt. We immediately hit it off. Um, they met on ships off the coast of Newfoundland, then an independent British colony. They didn't decide anything very practical, but the symbolism was very important. Here are the two leaders, one of a country, in battle country at war, another from the great power that is helping it, now meeting with their military aides at sea. It's an extremely important moment, and it was seen as such by Hitler, who, who was observing this. Um, they don't make any decisions, really. They, they put out, they put out a, a, something called the Atlantic Charter, which talks, this is very much at Roosevelt's insistence, which talks about what the world should look like once the war is over, how it should be a world in which countries have self-determination, choose their own governments, trade is freer to bring countries closer together, um, disarmament will be encouraged, um, they pledge that they will want no territorial acquisitions for themselves. Now it's a piece of wartime propaganda, but it's quite effective because it is so different from what Nazi Germany is saying and doing. And again, Roosevelt moves in his own inimitable and, and often cautious way towards greater confrontation with Germany. In September 1941, an American warship destroyer called the Greer was attacked by a German submarine as it was patrolling within what the Americans had decided with, with, with the waters they were going to protect. It was off Iceland, but the Americans had declared that these were all part of the American defensive zone. What Roosevelt didn't mention was the Greer had actually been shadowing the submarine for several hours and the submarine then attacked it. Um, the point was from the American public point of view, an American warship had been attacked unprovoked by a German submarine. And again, he did a fireside chat. He said, you can see now in the attack on the Greer that the Nazis are trying to control the oceans and subvert the Western hemisphere. The US Navy is now going to protect all merchant shipping of whatever country in US defensive waters. In, sorry, I'm very bad at, that's the, I'm sorry, I keep on forgetting to show my PowerPoint. That's the Atlantic Conference, um, the two of them met. And this is my final slide. Um, this is the Lord Beaverbrook, the American um, politician, and Avril Harriman, who among other things was going to be ambassador to, to Moscow, promoting aid to Russia. So you get a tremendous shift by the end of the summer of 1941. And so what I want to talk about next time is how the British and American relationship continues to develop or perhaps goes in a slightly different direction and how those two countries have to now deal with this really unknown quantity of the Soviet Union and the unknown quantity of its leader. And so that's what I'll be talking about again. But this development of this, what came to be called the Grand Alliance is as you can see a complicated story, it wasn't easy. And it had strains within it, which of course were gonna come out when they made the peace, but that's for another story. I apologize for not showing my PowerPoints in the right order, but um, anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Before I open it up to um, the public here, can I just ask two questions? Um, you started with definitions, because the first thing that came to my mind was that uh, wonderful comment, I think, by Ambrose Bierce in the Devil's Dictionary, that an alliance is where two people have each, e their hands in each other's pockets so deeply that they can't steal from one another. And uh, that reminded me of the kind of Nazi-Soviet pact, uh, in a way. So what is the difference between this alliance, which was evolving, and we haven't quite, you didn't quite get to, to Pearl Harbor and 
the actual alliance and the war. And the two that you mentioned, the Nazi-Soviet pact and the tripartite uh, pact between Italy, Germany, and Japan. If you had to define those, are those alignments, not alliances, or are they a different kind of alliance? I, you, I think alignment is probably better. I mean, I think with Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, it was very matter, much a matter of convenience and each had their long-term goals. And there was very little um, in common between their two nations, very little in common between the types of political system they had, very little alignment of values or interests, and very little interest in what the world would look like afterwards because each had its own different goals. And I think, you know, on the Nazi side, it was completely cynical. They simply wanted to keep Russia quiet while they polished off Poland and took what they wanted in the center of Europe. And on the Soviet side, it was, I think, simply a holding action. You know, Stalin, as, as a good Marxist-Leninist, thought that the capitalist powers would try and destroy the Soviet Union. But once they'd, once, you know, that the, they would do their best to destroy it, but they would probably fight each other first. The capitalism was about dividing up the world that the capitalists would turn on each other. The Soviet Union could quietly grow stronger. And then eventually the one remaining capitalist power would try and destroy socialism in the form of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union would be ready for it. And so I think neither had any interest in a long-term mm -hmm. friendship. They simply wanted what they could get out of it. What the Soviet Union wanted was German military equipment. And they asked for the latest equipment. They asked for engineers to help them build it. They asked for assistance in that. What they also wanted was large parts of the center of Europe, just as the Nazis wanted large parts of the center of Europe. And the Nazis wanted Soviet raw materials. They wanted oil from the Caucasus. They wanted grain. Um, but I think the extraordinary thing is Stalin. I still don't understand. I mean, Stalin, who was one of the most suspicious men in the world, who didn't trust anyone. You know, he didn't trust his parrot because it made fun of him. I mean, he didn't trust anyone. And he trusted Hitler for some reason. And he got all these warnings, not just from Churchill, which you can see why Stalin might think Churchill would want me to follow up with Hitler, but he got all these warnings. He was getting them from his troops on the ground who said, you know, there are an awful lot of German troops there. They seem to be moving close to the border and he simply ignored them all. And there is a story which is denied, but I think may be true that when the Germans actually attacked, he sort of disappeared for two days with a bottle of vodka and couldn't cope because um, he was so stunned by mm. this. Mm. Um, my second question, I, I just read this book, a recent book by Brendan Sims, Hitler's American yeah. Gamble, which argues that had it not been for two factors, the United States would have come into the war eventually against Germany, but not necessarily in 1941, probably halfway through 1942. The two factors being that Hitler propelled them into the war, his hatred of the Anglo-America, capitalism, etc., that uh, you mentioned in my camp. And the second thing, of course, was he was absolutely convinced that the United States would declare war on him and he hated people declaring war on him. He liked declaring war yeah. on other people. Yeah. So he thought he would preemptively yeah. strike first. Yeah. Is there any mileage in that book from your point of view or for that argument? Yeah, I, say, I not thought it was a very book. good book and I thought it really laid out the, the alternatives very clearly. I mean, I think Hitler was convinced that sooner or later he was going to have to fight mm. the US. Um, you know, if you look back, it's, it's not in Mein Kampf. It was the unpublished manuscript he did, I think, mm. where he talked about his geopolitical ideas. And he saw the United States as eventually the power that would, would challenge Germany. And of course, he also, I think, um, although the Sims and, and uh, Lad Ladderman book didn't go into it much, I think he was tripped up by his own racial theories because he, he, he called the United States a mongrel nation, a mix of races. And so they couldn't fight in the same way that Germans could. Um, so I think he, he felt he might as well declare war on them because he was going to have to anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but the fact that he declared war on the United States in December 1941, I think, brought the United States in more united than mm, it might have mm, otherwise mm. been. And likewise, the Japanese had never been defeated in 2000 years, he said. So he thought that was a great ally yeah. to have on your side. Well, let's open it up um, to, the, uh, to the, all of you in this room. Could I just say, if, if you're going to ask a question, can you remove your mask when you uh, ask the question? There's a microphone which is passing around if you'd like to ask a question could you also say who you are um, before you say what the question is uh, peter yeah so thank you very much for a great lecture um in terms of alliances i mean you are very broadly saying that there's three aspects to them there's obviously interests values 
but also you brought out the institutional aspect, yeah. the um, joint command structure, the um, boards and so on. And I just wonder if you could say a bit more about who were the key people that helped develop those things? I mean, was it, what was the balance between sort of military and diplomatic effort? Yeah. But also to what extent do you think that the gradual emergence of those structures actually helped to cement the alliance or was it more the politicians and the pressure of events that did that? I, I think that it's, it's both really, that um, both Churchill and Roosevelt kept very firm eye on, on, the, on, the, on the military and the strategy. You know, they, they both wanted, not that they, Churchill interfered more than Roosevelt did, but both wanted their office to be the place that the strategy was, was decided. But of course they had to leave a great deal to those they trusted to actually do, do the organization. And I think it was tremendous structure that was built up. I mean, I think what was important was that the US military, particularly the armies came to trust each other a lot and work with each other. Um, the British military representative in Washington, um, Dill, became very close to, to Marshall and others. And I think was very important in, in, in trying to um, smooth over, over some, of, some of the difficulties in the relationship. And I think you got very sustained engagement. I mean, it, it comes out in Harold Macmillan's diaries, just how much they worked with each other, saw each other, had meals with each other, um, began to understand each other's ways of thinking. I mean, I'm not sure it was ever complete, but I think that there was um, tremendous sort of, um, at a personal level, a great deal of interaction and working together, but also a great deal of formal structure. And both Churchill and Roosevelt also liked using um, in, informal envoys. And so when they found themselves in a, in a difficult situation, they would write directly to each other or they'd send someone Hopkins, although he was absolutely Roosevelt's man, was actually very important in, in often helping to get Churchill's point of view over to Roosevelt. Um, and Roosevelt liked using such people. Hopkins for a long time actually had no, no official title, but he was very, very important in the inner circle. Avril Harriman was another one until they fell out over the Soviet Union that, that um, Roosevelt relied a lot. And Churchill relied on people like Beaverbrook, whom he'd send off on missions to Moscow or send off on, on missions to Washington. So some of it was ad hoc, but gradually this whole network of organization grew up and you got people you know, in the military, in the treasury, in, the, in both the treasury in the US and, and in Britain, um, and you've got procurement boards, you've got people working together on, on what sort of things they needed to get, what sort of equipment the British needed, um, you've got scientists working together. So it was, it was a combination, I think, of informality, but an awful lot of committees and structures. And I think it worked as effectively as it did because they had a certain amount of time to develop it. And I think they did have this underpinning of organization. Um, the values were never completely aligned, but they, they were aligned enough they could work together. And, and in some ways, of course, I mean, a lot of Americans thought all the British were like Churchill, who was an arch imperialist and kept on saying how he didn't want the British Empire to disappear. But there were a lot of British who weren't like that at all, including in the government. And I think a lot of them worked, uh, were more sympathetic to American attitudes on empire, and were prepared to work with them and prepared to accept that the empire was going to go. So I'm not sure that there was any one factor that made it work. I think it was this, this overlapping and I think very key that Churchill laid himself out, which was not easy for someone like Churchill, I think, to subordinate himself in this way, but he made it absolutely clear from the beginning that he had to get on with Roosevelt. And he put up with a lot. You know, there were times when Roosevelt humiliated him as he did at Tehran um, in front of Stalin and Churchill more or less put up with it simply because he thought it was necessary for, for the future of Britain. Um, so it was, you know, it was an evolving relationship, but it was a relationship which I think worked surprisingly well. And militarily on the ground, um, British and, and American troops did work very well with each other. And the fact that, that they did have a supreme commander from Faye Leon when Eisenhower was appointed um, did I think make a great difference. And Eisenhower was, was a great state, was, he was a great politician and statesman. He may not have been a great general, but he was absolutely the person I think that was needed to keep the British and, and American military working in the same direction and, and not, and there were always rivalries, they're bound to be, but I think Eisenhower played a very important part in, in making sure that those weren't all that damaging. 
It's interesting you mentioned Sir John Dill because when he died, he was given a full military funeral, wasn't he? He's buried at Arlington. And buried at Arlington. Uh, it is often said that Churchill didn't go to Roosevelt's funeral because he had been humiliated so much. It was a kind of personal snub. Do you buy into that or not? Yeah, I think, no, I think, I mean, both men were very strong characters. Both mm. were used to being in charge. And I think for Churchill, it must have been difficult. And Roosevelt, you know, there was, I more and more think there was a nasty side to Roosevelt. He liked teasing people, mm. you know, and the sort of people who tease people and say, oh, it's just a joke are often very unkind. Um, and I, I think Roosevelt I them, yes. was unkind yeah, to Churchill. Absolutely. Right. Um, there's a question at the very back there. Uh, hello, my name is Stephen Boyle. Thank you very much indeed for the lecture. What efforts did Germany make in the 30s and in the early years of the war to keep the US neutral? What efforts did Germany make to keep the US neutral? I don't think very much. Um, I think they were a bit cautious about sinking American shipping at first. And they tried, there is a story, Roosevelt called Churchill in the fall of 1939 and said, we've received a report that the Germans are planning to blow up an American liner and blame the British for it. And the liner, mm. I think at this point, I'm trying to remember the name of it, was in port in Ireland. Mm. And um, Churchill said, this is very unfortunate. You know, we, we, what could we do? And I think the ship was searched and there was, Churchill said, you know, there could possibly be a bomb on board and the ship was searched and it, it did turn out not to be a bomb, but it may well have been that the Germans tried to spread disinformation to cause difficulties in the relationship between the United States and Britain. But my sense is, and I may be wrong, maybe someone can correct me, that Churchill wasn't really focused that much on the United States at this point. Um, he wanted to destroy Britain. He wanted to bring the British Isles under his control. And what he really wanted to do was turn east and invade Russia. Um, which is one of the reasons why in the end he tried to bring Britain under control by the Blitz uh, because a seaborne invasion was going to take too long. And he was, I think he was focused very much on the East and wanting to move East. So I don't, but as I say, someone may be able to correct me. I don't have much sense that the Germans really made much effort with the United States. Um, the United States had already broken off or downgraded diplomatic relations after Kristallnacht. They'd withdrawn their ambassador. And so relations were already pretty bad. And I don't see much attempt on, on Hitler's um, to do it. I mean, in fact, he mocked, I think Roosevelt made some sort of, um, he sent a peace mission with Sumner Wells at the beginning of 1939 and, and Hitler was very rude about it. Um, you know, he, he, he said what a you know, ludicrous thing to do and, and laughed at Roosevelt's attempts to um, push for peace in Europe. So I don't think, um, I think Germany had already, in the person of Hitler, had already made up its mind and, and didn't care that much about the United States. This is the Reichstag speech, was it? Where Roosevelt yes. said, you know, these are the 14 countries you mustn't invade. Yeah. And he went through the whole list. Yes, and yeah. laughed. And, and, they, laughed. and all the Nazis cheered yeah. and jeered and laughed. And yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's on YouTube, so it's quite an interesting mm -hmm. thing to see. I think there's a question over there. Yes. Yes, thank you for the lecture. I would like to bring the concept and nature of alliances into the present moment. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, so it, it's my understanding that before the, the Second World War, uh, people across countries and across continents largely lived in their own spheres. But since the Second World War, the, the world has experienced um, an increasing interconnectedness in terms of trade in commodities and manufactured goods in uh, information technology and also interconnectedness between people. And so I'm interested to know how do you think this increasing interconnectedness has changed the nature of alliances since the Second War? Uh, that's very interesting. Um, has it changed them? I suppose what's become much more important is public diplomacy. Um, it was, I think, in the Second World War, how you appeal to the publics on the other side. But in a world that is as interconnected electronically and through communications as ours is, how you assure the other side that you're friendly or not friendly, I think has become more and more important. And how you maintain an alliance is now not just dealing with elites, it's dealing with the people in a country. But again, that was there in the past, but perhaps it's even more present now. Um, but interconnectedness doesn't always mean we're going to like each other better. You know, I mean, I think um, 
in the First World War, Britain and Germany were each other's greatest trading partners. And it didn't stop them from being very suspicious of each other. And, and you look at the interconnectedness between the Chinese economy and the American economy, um, it's not playing out um, in producing greater friendship. So it's it's interesting. I mean, I think I think what we're seeing today, this is not quite directly answering your question, but I think what we're seeing today is a realization that the maintenance of alliance is important. You know, you sign the you sign the you sign the founding document of NATO, but the organization has to be nurtured it well in the case of nato it had to be brought into existence there was no military organization until um until the 1950s but you also have to maintain it and you also have to have frequent meetings with alliance partners and you have to keep them on side and i think we're recognizing that again today um, just the importance the, the work that needs to go into maintaining an alliance and i think public diplomacy is important i think countries do take it very seriously um, how do you you know build friendship between between different peoples and how do you persuade them that they actually should want their governments to work with each other? Uh, Dave, do we have any questions online? Yeah, this one's from um, Vijay Shrell. Uh, the United Kingdom and France wanted to keep their empires, whereas the USA wanted to end them. Did the USA, through alliance and war, deliberately manage to end their allies' empires, or was it just an unintended consequence? Um, the United States certainly was anti-empire, and Roosevelt always made it clear that the United States was not fighting to maintain the British Empire or, or enabling the British, the Dutch, and the French to get back those parts of the, their empires they'd lost um, to the Japanese, for example, to the Japanese mainly in the Second World War. Um, the United States did not take direct action um, to force the Europeans to give up their empires. It, it, certainly indirectly made it more difficult than to hang on. I mean, one of the things Truman did was cut off Lend-Lease very sharply. Um, when the war ended in Europe, suddenly the British weren't getting any more Lend-Lease and that of course hit the British economy very hard. And so it was more difficult, I think, for the British and, and, and French to hang on. Um, but the United States didn't actively force them to give up their colonies. I think what the Second World War did, in, in my view, um, is simply accelerate a trend that was happening anyway. You know, there was a large popular based nationalist movement in India, the British had already been forced to concede in the reforms of um, 1921 and then 1936, a large measure of self government to India. And it was quite clear that India was moving in the direction of much greater autonomy, um, there was talk of, of making it um, as autonomous as Canada or Australia were but if the Indians themselves, of course, were going to want more than that. But the British and the French were no longer capable um, of dealing with those forces of nationalism, which had been vastly increased by the Second World War. The Japanese victories helped to destroy the prestige of both of all three European empires, the Dutch, the, Brit the British and the French in Asia. You know, the ways in which um, the white rulers of those colonies uh, made a, often a mess of defending them and, and were put into prison camps, I think really destroyed the authority um, of the, the white empires in Asia. And so I think what the Second World War does is, is accelerate a trend that's already happening. The United States isn't going to support the European empires and getting back into their empires, although they try and support each other. But I don't think the United States actively played a role. It was, it was more simply not supporting them and not giving them economic aid and making it clear that it had absolutely no sympathy with their desire to hang on to their colonies. We have one more. I think we have to be the last uh, question, unfortunately. Uh, so linking it to um, current affairs, Stephen Glick asks, are there any lessons the US learned in the pre-41 situation that can or should be applied to today's war in Ukraine? Uh, I don't know. You we were going to get a Ukraine question. Yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about Ukraine, but I don't think the United States looked at the pre-41 period and drew many lessons from it. I suppose the lesson the United States and well, certainly presidents could draw is that you have to move with public opinion. Roosevelt was always very careful not to get too far out ahead of public opinion, which is one of the reasons people often found him difficult to deal with because he'd test something and if he got a reaction, he'd back off. You know, it was never quite clear where he was going, but he was, I think, very skillful at making sure that he didn't go too far ahead of American public opinion. And perhaps that's what um, presidents might, if they looked at his example, learn from him, that he always brought public opinion with him. And he was um, a really, in my view, a great communicator. He explained to the Americans what he was doing. 
and he explained why they should be worried about certain things. And he didn't push it too much. He didn't try and, you know, if he, if he encountered resistance in Congress, he'd back off. Um, but he gradually, I think, prepared the Americans for the prospect that they might have to fight in 1941. So I suppose that's what you could learn from it. I think today, far more people are looking at containment um, or they're looking at, at what the British and French should have done differently before 1939. Um, you know, the, there are a number of historical events back there. You, there are no lessons, but there are, there are things which, which perhaps have relevance for today. And I think one is um, the failure, if you like, of appeasement. You know, at what point do you say enough is enough? And I think this is what um, the West is now collectively dealing with. In, in, with you know, if Putin goes further, what, what do we do? When, when is enough is enough? Um, but the other one, I think, which people are talking about is containment, that if you want to contain an aggressive power, it's going to cost you, you're going to, it's going to take, it's not going to be easy, it's going to take a long time, and you have to be in for the long haul, and you have to hope your public opinion stays with you. Um, and I think we're confronting these questions at the moment. I don't know the answers. I think time will, will show where, where we go with this. Um, and I suppose the final one I would think of if I'm thinking about Ukraine is the outbreak of the First World War. Um, accidents happen. And sometimes people get themselves into situations they didn't intend to, and then it's very difficult to back out. I think we've actually got time for one last question. Is, is there uh, anyone in the audience? Yes. yes. In the center here. Can you just put your hand up again so they can recognize you? Thanks. Hi, I'm Evie. Thank you so much. It was really, really interesting. Um, you talked a little bit about like the geographical positioning of the countries. Do you think that these um, geographical positions of the USA and the, um, the UK determined that there are different kind of roles in the relationship going into World War II? Yeah, I think geography matters hugely. Sorry, did you finish? Yeah, I think geography matters enormously. I mean, one of the reasons the British have always seen themselves as not really being part of Europe is because they're, they're a set of islands. Um, and that's always, of course, made the Navy extremely important to them. The British have always neglected their army, um, never spent much on it, never really paid much attention. The Navy has always been, been crucial. And being, on, being an island also, a set of islands, I think also makes the British look both to the continent but outwards. And I think that has affected the British view. I mean, you saw it in the, in the debates over Brexit. I mean, we, we got a lot of stuff, I think, often very bad history about how we ruled the seas and how we did this and Nelson and so on. There was, there was a lot of sort of parking back um, to that. And the United States as well, I mean, has been, I think, so protected by its geography. I mean, I think it was a real shock for Americans when they realized that they could be vulnerable to attacks from abroad. I, th I think I've got it right, but David Reynolds always uses this example. Uh, that something like five Americans were killed on the mainland of the United States by enemy action in the Second World War. And that was a party of school children with their teacher who were caught when a Japanese firebomb blew over and set the forest on fire on the West Coast. The Americans weren't used to being attacked on the mainland. And, and you know, I think even today, that geography, even though now they are vulnerable because of, of modern technology, affects American thinking. I don't know how many of you have ever been to the American Midwest but you feel very far away from the rest of the world when you're there. And you feel you know, that, that the world is not gonna bother you very much. You know, you're in the middle of a very big landmass. And so, yes, I think geography is, is hugely important. So are other things, but geography really helps to shape the ways in which peoples look at the world. Well, I'm afraid uh, this has to be the last question, but thank you very much for, for your questions. Also the people online. I'd like to thank you, the audience for coming out this evening. It's, it's great to have uh, in in person event uh, finally, and I will, I'd like to thank Margaret for coming. Um, she's going back to Canada at the weekend, but she will be back on May the twenty sixth, I think, uh, for her final lecture. Thank you very much for a great lecture. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.